Welcome back to our study of the schools of taxonomy. We're going to be turning to the school called phonetics today. Before we do, I want to tell you this is going to be, as much as possible, an interactive lecture. That is, at some place during the lecture, some places, I will ask you to stop the video and answer some questions. Then you can restart the video and see what I say about those. This is really an important part of your learning, and so I really hope you're going to do it. But we are going to practice right now so you get the hang of this. So, I want you to pause the video and answer the question, What did the baby corn say to the mama corn? Did you pause it? I can tell you didn't pause it. Ah, you think I can't tell? You didn't pause it. You didn't pause it. Pause the video. Well, that was better. Some of you paused it. Okay, here it is. You got that, right? Okay, let's get going with our study of phonetics. So this is our next school of taxonomy, phonetics. Pheno means to show, has a Greek root, and so this is the study of the appearance of organisms and how we're going to use the appearance of organisms to make classifications. Now phonetics originated in the 50s or so when it first began, it wasn't when the book was written, but the ideas started to appear. And um, we couldn't extract DNA at that time and use molecular characteristics. But if we could have done it, uh, the phoneticists would have used those kinds of characteristics. Maybe they wouldn't have called their school phonetics. In fact, they called the book that was written Numerical Taxonomy. by Sokol and Sneath. So they kind of were aware that these techniques that they were developing could be applied to other things besides the external appearance of organisms. But at the time, that's how they were used, initially used for the external appearance of organisms, and that's how we'll approach them for this class. Now, as I say, the book was called Numerical Taxonomy, and the existence of this book is one of the things that makes this a school. The book lays out the fundamental principles in the first chapter of Numerical Taxonomy, Fundamental Principles of Phonetics. But the name Numerical Taxonomy is really a misnomer in some ways, because any um, numerical method could be called a numerical taxonomic method. And so all of the methods of phylogenetic systematics, which we'll study later, are numerical. It's gotten very mathematical now, and they're all numerical mathematics. You could call everything that we do in phylogenetic systematics numerical taxonomy now, but Sokol and Sneath used it for the book, so numerical taxonomy is what their book is called. And kind of because of there's this problem with the word numerical taxonomy, um, it could be used for other kinds of techniques, most people refer to the school as the School of Phonetics. So who are the inspirers for this school? Besides Sokol and Sneath, of course, who wrote the book on it. But if they, Sokol and Sneath looked back to two important taxonomists who preceded them, it turns out uh, they were both, or at least Ray was, um, a botanist. So one was John Ray and one was Michael Adinson. And of course you remember that Ray advocated for the use of as many characters as possible. And Adinson advocated for the fact that all characters should get equal weight.
And this is in contrast to what um, other taxonomists were doing, like think back to Theophrastus or Linnaeus. Linnaeus was actually after Addison, but the point is that they used just a few characteristics to make their classifications. And Ray wanted to use all characteristics, and Addison said, yes, use them all, and they should be all equal weighted. We don't have any way to know which are the more important ones. So the Phenicists pointed to these two predecessors because of what they wanted their classifications to be. And what they wanted for their classifications was them for it to be objective and re objective and repeatable. They wanted their uh, classifications to be this way, objective and repeatable, probably because they looked at what was being done in classical taxonomy or evolutionary systematics. And as we've seen, that's all kind of idiosyncratic. Each individual evolutionary taxonomist had their own kind of approach to their characters. They might emphasize one character over another. Another taxonomist might emphasize a different set of characters. There were some similarities between the classifications they developed, but sometimes they were pretty they were pretty different. So this idea that each individual could have their own kind of a way of approaching the data, that classification could be as much as an art of a science, was really an anathema to these phoneticists. They said, well, look at that. That's not science. I don't know what that is, but whatever that is, that's not science. We Science is objective. Science is uh, repeatable. Let's get some methods here that really allow us to make objective, repeatable classifications. And so they looked at Ray and Addison, and they said, "Well, this is a good. These are good starting places. Let's use as many characters as possible. Let's not try to select which characters are more important based on kind of what we think are the best characters. Just use them all. And since we don't know." Which one should be given more weight than others? I mean, is it just opinion which one should be given weight? I mean, how do we decide which one should be given more weight, which should be given more attention? Well, we don't know, so let's just equally weight them. So this desire for objectivity and repeatability is really strong within phonetics, and you can probably see the argument for that based on what you know about classical taxonomy, evolutionary systematics. Well, the first thing that Sokol and Sneath do in their book is they lay down some principles, seven fundamental principles of numerical taxonomy. And we're going to work through these principles one at a time. On some of them, like number three, we're going to spend a long time. And on some of them, some of the later principles, you're going to say, well, why wasn't that principle number one? We understand that already. We've kind of covered that already, and yet it's going to be principle number seven or number eight. So some of them we'll go over very quickly. So, seven fundamental principles of phonetics. The first one. I'll read it once and then write it out. Better classifications have a greater information content and are based on a greater number of characters. Better classifications have a greater information content and are based on a greater number of characters.
Let's take this apart. Better classifications. Well, better is a relative term. Better than what? Well, almost certainly they think that their classifications are better than the traditional evolutionary systematic or classical taxonomy classifications. I've kind of covered that already. Those classifications, they look at those and they say, well, I don't even know how this guy came up with this classification. We can do better than that. And the classifications then that they think are going to be better are those that are based on a greater number of characters. So this first principle is going to directly relate to Ray's idea of the greater number of characters. We'll see the second principle, which we'll list on the next slide, will bring in Addison. So better classifications have a greater number of characters. More characters, the better. And they are going to have this thing that they call a greater information content. It's hard to know exactly what they meant by greater information content, but they probably meant something like this. They probably meant that, let's say we've got a new taxon, a new species, which we've just discovered, and we know where it goes in our classification system. Will knowing that, will knowing where it comes in the classification system, let us predict its characteristics before we any look at any of those characteristics. Kind of a weird idea, isn't it? Kind of what can we know what the characteristics are of this organism are going to be before we look at them just by knowing where it comes in the classification system. And the phoneticist says, yeah, do classification our way and you can know that. You can know those characters before you look at the organism. Does the classification allow us to predict the existence of unobserved characters just by knowing where a taxon fits in the classification system. And the phoneticists are going to say Say, heck yes, if you follow our rules. Now this claim, this audacious claim that their classification is best will be challenged by a very well-known phylogenetic systematist in the 80s. And he's going to say, no, your classifications are not better. They do not have greater information content. The classifications created according to phylogenetic systematics methods, those are the better ones. And he offers a mathematical, a very elaborate mathematical, what he claims is a proof of this. So this claim of a greater information content is going to come back and bite the phoneticists. And it's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, that 
people are no longer, many, most taxonomists are no longer phoneticists. There are some techniques that are still used, phonetic techniques that are used in analyzing DNA, but basically no functioning operational taxonomist today would say that they are a phoneticist. Okay, let's look at our second big claim. Fundamental characteristic, fundamental principle, every character is given equal weight. So in other words, phonetics is an Adansonian system. It follows the principles of Michael Adamson. Third fundamental principle, and this is the hard one, which we'll spend a lot of time on. I will read it once, and then I'll write it out. The overall similarity of two taxa, or of two individuals, is a function of the individual similarities of the characters of those taxa or of those individuals. Let's write it. So the overall similarity, so they're cons they're cons they want to know how similar two things are together. So they want to know how similar two tacks are together. Not on one character, not do they both have opposite leaves. That would be the similarity on one character. They want to know the overall similarity, the similarity that's total between these two. How really similar are they of two taxa? Now you can study the whole taxa, a whole species or a whole genus, but you could also do the same question or ask the same question about individuals. So we say, the overall similarity of two taxa or of two individuals, and I'm just going to abbreviate that by writing in parentheses the words or individuals. The overall similarity of two taxa or of two individuals is a function. So what that means is there's just a way that we can get that overall similarity. A function means we're going to do something, make some measurements, and that's going to give us the overall similarity. And the way that we make those measurements, that's what our function is. Function is how we do it. So it's a function of the individual similarities So we've constrained the way that we're going to do this now. So we could just look at two individuals and say, oh, those are about a similarity of two. Oh, now take another two individuals and say, oh, those two are about a similarity of one, one being a little more similar than two, right? We could just kind of do a seat of the pants similarity. That would be a function of the similarity of two taxa. But they're saying, don't do that. They're saying, look at the individual similarities. So what does that mean, individual similarities? So let's just say we've got two taxa in front of us. No, let's say two individuals. Since we can do this with individuals, and maybe I should complete the next phrase. No, I'll do that in a minute. OK, so the individual similarity of two individuals. Got two individuals standing in front of us. And I'm going to point at the one on my left and the one on my right. and the individual is going to be, these are human individuals, human beings. One on my left is going to have black hair, one on my life right has blonde hair. Well, that's not very similar. So let's score that as a zero. And now we're going to look at the one on the left and it has brown eyes. And the one on the right has brown eyes. Look at that. There's that similar in those. So let's score that as one. And now we're going to look at the chin of the one on the left 
and that's got a rounded chin. And the one on the right, well, that person has a rounded chin too. We'll score that as one again. So now we've got three individual similarities, and we have to make some function that we're going to summarize those similarities all as one overall similarity. Lots of ways we could do that, but we've got a zero, a one, and a one. Act, let's just add them up. Zero plus one plus one. So the overall similarity in this new numerical method we've just made up between these two individuals, one brown-haired individual with brown eyes and a round chin, and one on my right-hand side, blonde-haired individual with brown eyes and a round chin, the overall similarity between those two individuals is two, according to this function of looking at the individual similarities. So that's what they mean so far. We're going to make up some way of doing the overall similarity of two taxa, and we're going to use individual similarities of the characters of those taxa. or of those individuals. So what's our really important stuff here? The really important words on this are the overall similarity the individ and the individual similarities of the characters. And the function that means a way of calculating the overall similarity based on the individual similarities. So when they did this process, they would come up with something that the phoneticists called a coefficient of similarity. So that's the result. Result of applying the function is a coefficient of similarity. A coefficient of similarity ran from a low of 0 to 1. So in this case, 0 equals completely different. And 1 would mean the two individuals were identical. And that would mean identical in all the characteristics that you measured. And because you're supposed to be looking at as many characteristics as possible, you should always, if the individuals are different from each other in anything, you should capture that because you're looking at every kind of possible characteristic. Now, just to make things complex, and because these guys were basically mathematicians who came up with these ideas, mathematicians and statisticians, they said, well, not only could we look at the coefficient of similarity, but we could also create something they called the coefficient of dissimilarity. Coefficient of dissimilarity ran from 1 to 0, where 0 was identical and 1 was completely different. And you see how confusing that is. And so we are not going to talk about any more coefficients of dissimilarities. You can read 
Sokol and Sneef's book if you want to know more about them, but for us we're just going to talk about the coefficient of similarity. There's other kinds of measures that you could have besides these coefficients between 0 and 1. We'll do some examples with those, but another very common and easy to use one would be percent similarity. So that's another possible overall measure of similarity. As I say, we're going to mostly be thinking about coefficient of similarities. Before we can do anything more with understanding this third fundamental principle, we need to think about what a taxon is in phonetics. So the phoneticists have kind of a funny way of thinking about taxa. Remember that they want to get a classification that is objective and repeatable. And if you start by knowing what your taxa are, you've kind of defeated the purpose of having an intuitive classification. Right? So you've got this problem of a starting point. If you know what the starting point is, there had to be some way to know what that was. And if you knew what that was, that means you didn't know, use phonetic methods. You must have used methods of classical taxonomy to make your starting point, to know what your taxa were. And the phoneticists didn't like that. They wanted completely objectivity in how the taxa were defined. So for a phoneticist, you don't start with known taxa. As strange as that seems, you start with a hypothesis of what a taxa is. So we start with a hypothesis of taxa, not with predefined taxa, because if we had predefined taxa, we had to use some method to get them, and we obviously didn't use a phonetic method to get them, so they're not really objective, so let's not do that. Let's just start with some hypothesis of taxa. We're going to say, okay, we've got to start some way, so we're going to use these as hypotheses. Maybe we'll modify them. We might modify them after we do our phonetic analysis, and in fact, this this happened sometimes, especially at the species level. It's a little more than we can deal go into here in this lecture, but you can look into the phonetic literature, the taxonomic literature from the 60s and 70s, and you'll see cases where people redefined species boundaries, that is circumscription of species, based on phonetic analyses. So that means their hypothesis of what the species was their hypothesis of the circumscription was shown not to be right by the phonetic analysis, and it was modified. So if you don't have taxa, you can't call them by taxonomic names. So what did a phoneticist talk about when they wanted to refer to a taxa? Well, they referred to operational taxonomic units. or much more commonly OTUs, because who wants to say operational taxonomic unit every time you talk about these things? So as I said, the OTU definitions could be modified
after a phonetic analysis. Okay, so we are not going to talk about taxa. We are going to talk about OTUs. And we're going to collect data on our OTUs. So you might think about this as collecting data on a species. You go out and you collect an individual in the field and you make some measurements on it and that measurement is on, we would say, in normal taxonomic practice we're measuring something about a spe an individual a member of a population or an individual member of a species. And what they phoneticists would say is we're measuring a something about a hypothesized member of a population or a hypothesized member of a species. And our general name for that is going to be an operational taxonomic unit. So we're going to collect data on an OTU and that what that means is that we're going to collect data on the characters of an OTU. I said singular but could be plural of course. And from that we are going to create a matrix. And that's going to be a character by OTU matrix. Let's look at what one of those might look like. So I'm going to make three columns and three rows. And on the top, I am going to write the word characters. And I will just number those characters. I will call them character 1, character 2, and character 3. And on the other side, I am going to write the letters OTU or OTUS, and I will call them OTU A, B, and C. So we have three T OTUs and three characters. And now we're going to go out and we're going to measure something about these characters. For let's just say that character one is leaf arrangement. I'm going to run out of space here. I'll write it up here for the right now. And we go out and we measure it. And we find that OTOA has alternate leaves. And OTOB has alternate leaves. And OTUC has opposite leaves. And let's say character 2 is flower color. And we go and we measure them. We find that OTUA has red flowers. OTO, OTUB has yellow. And OTUC has red flowers. And we could continue this for many other kinds of characteristics. Now, we need some way of converting these verbal descriptions of the characters into numbers. And we want to do that because if we have numbers we can do all kinds of numerical operations. So let's see how we would do that. I'm going to redraw our character by OTU matrix over here. I want to make it exactly the same. Three rows, three columns,
I'm going to do it all in red this time just for simplicity, but we're going to have characters at the top and OTUs vertically. So our characters are 1, 2, and 3. Our OTUs are A, B, and C. And we're going to convert our characteristics. I'm going to use a different color. I forgot I'd used purple already. Convert our characteristics into numbers. And the way we do this is pretty arbitrary. We're just going to say now that alternate leaves, we're going to call that a zero. So we have two zeros and we're going to call opposite leaves a one. So this process is called character coding. So the green is character coding. We're making the characters, or changing the characters, from these verbal descriptions into numbers. Now these numbers really aren't numbers in a certain say. They are symbols. They're symbols that represent character states. So these things circled over here are our character states. And character coding translates our character states from a verbal meth mode of representation to a numerical mode. And we can do that for all of our characters. We can do that also for the flower color, red, yellow, and red. And let's again just call the red flowers zero, the yellow flowers one, and the red flowers, again, zero. So this orange is also character coding. And we do that now for all of our characteristics. And now we have a way of doing operations. We can use numerical operations on these characters. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to find our overall similarities. between pairs of OTUs. So we're going to calculate pairwise distances or differences. Let's call it different distances because difference means there's a certain way of doing it. You'd subtract, but it's really distances. So we're going to compare, in other words, we are going to compare A with B, A with C, B with C, etc. for all pairs of taxa. So we're going to create, then, a, a new kind of matrix. A 
similarity matrix. It's given other names, a matrix of resemblance, other names besides that. But this matrix is going to compare OTUs to OTUs, just like we talked about above, A with B, A with C, etc. So it's going to look like this. Draw a matrix out. Again, we're going to use three taxa, so we're going to have three rows, three columns. But now it's OTU to OTU, so we have OTU on the top and OTU on the side. And our OTUs, remember, are A, B, and C, and A, B, and C. And now, when we think about this, what is the similarity, a coefficient of similarity is what we're talking about, of A to A? So let's just back up for one second and say what we want there. We want to fill in this table. with coefficients of similarity. We'll talk about how we calculate those in a minute. Right now we're just looking at the basic principles. So what is the coefficient of similarity between A and A? Remember, 0 is complete dissimilar and 1 is completely similar. So A to A itself completely similar. It's identical. B to itself is completely similar. It's identical. C to itself is completely similar. It's identical. How about the similarity of A to B? Well, it's something. I don't mean to make that a zero. I mean, that's, I'm saying there's something in there. How does that compare with the similarity of A to B? So what would we expect about these two numbers, similarity AB versus AB? Well, the similarity of A to B should be the similarity of A to B. And so those two should be equal. Same thing here. The similarity of A to C should be similar uh, to the similarity of A to C. The similarity of B to C better be just exactly similarity of, similarity of the B to C. So in other words, this is a triangular matrix. The diagonal is a one, are all ones, and the values that are unique occur in half of the matrix. The matrix is symmetrical, in other words, across along that diagonal. You can fold it over itself on the diagonal, and the numbers match up. So we really only have to enter the numbers once in one part of the, the matrix. So let's see how we get that data matrix out of our character by OTU matrix. So here's our character matrix. I'm sorry, this is our data matrix. How are we going to get our similarity matrix, our distance matrix out of this? Here's our character matrix called a data matrix, called a character by taxon matrix, or a character by OTU matrix would be even bit better here. We've coded all the characters. For this purposes, we don't need to know 
what these characters refer to. Character one could be alternate leaves or leaf arrangement. Character two could be flower color. Character three could be um, what the cross section of the stem looks like right under the apex. This is a character that's used to key out woody twigs, etc. So we want a method now to calculate our similarity matrix. So there's a number of ways to do this. We're going to look at one way right now, and that way is to calculate the distance between the character states. Calculate the distance between the individual character states. So let's say we're going to start with the difference between A and B. So we want to know the distance between A and B. So we look at character 1 and we see that A has a character state of 1 and B has a character state of 2. The difference between them is 2. So that's our distance between those two characters. We subtract them. Same thing for character 2. Difference between A and B. We subtract the two diff these two character states we find it's a difference of 1. Character 3, difference of 1. Character 4, difference of 2. Now we want the overall similarity, remember? We've got the individual similarities. What we want is the overall similarity. So let's just add these up. So our overall similarity is a function of the individual similarities of the char individual characters. And that's what just what we've done. So we would take this overall similarity, this distance between A and B, and put it in our distance matrix. It is the d distance between these two characters based on this function.
So subtraction there is giving us the distance between these individual similarities between these two OTUs and then we're adding those up to get our overall distance or overall similarity between those two characteristics between those two OTUs overall similarity between those two OTUs. Let's do that exact same thing again here and fill in our matrix of resemblance, our similarity matrix, at least for that one characteristic. So again here we said the difference was 2, here the difference was 1, here the difference was 1, here the difference was 2, the total difference when we add them up is 6. So the, dis the distance between A and B, distance between A and B is 6. We could write it down here, but we don't need to. It's the same in both cases. So we're going to go and we're going to fill in the whole matrix like this. But before we do that, I want to look at the same thing we've just did, but we're going to look at it in a different way. So we're going to do the same thing we've just did, but we're going to consider it in a different way to make sure that we really understand it. Okay, we're going to use this slide to understand what we've just done in subtracting and then adding our characters together to get an overall similarity. To do this, let's first start by drawing our character by taxon matrix here right in the middle of this blank space. But we're only going to draw a small version of that matrix. We're going to draw it for two OT eight OTUs, A and B, and for two characters, character 1 and character 2. And if you recall from our matrix, our character states for character A on character 1 and character 2 were both 1's, and for B, uh, OTU B, they were 3 and 2. Now let's see how this character matrix is represented in this diagram. So we'll start by looking at OTU A first and we'll note that for character 1 we actually need to put some tick marks and um, character states here on our character diagram first before we can do this. So here's character state 1 2 and 3 and for character 1 OTU A has character state 1. So OTU A has character state 1 for character 1. For character 2, again we've got to put some tick marks and some character states here. Again, OTU A has character 1. And we see that up here, OTUA, character 1, state 1, OTUA, character 2, state 1. Now let's look at OTUB. For OTUB on character 1, it has character state 3. And for character 2, it has character state 2. So all of our characteristics there are represented. Now, if we want to look at the difference between OTU A and OTU B on character 1, this difference, we know that we subtract them. Well, how do we look at that on the graph? So here is the value of OTU A on character 1. Here is the value of 
OTUB on character 1. It is 1, I shouldn't circle that, 1 minus 3 equals 2. We ignore the minus sign here. So that's what we find here and what we did up here, 1 minus 3 or 3 minus 1 is 2. The first difference is 2. Now if we look at our second character, rather our second OTU, I'm sorry I said that right the first time. We look at our second character, character 2, and we want to know the difference between OTUB and OTUA on character 2. Well, it's this distance, B. It is 2 minus 1 equals 1. 2 minus 1, 1. So we can see here that if we take our two distances, our distance B here, and our distance A, that we just calculated, and we add them together, that's the same as doing what we've done already, 2 plus 1 equals 3, A plus B equals 2 plus 1 equals 3. So we're adding these two linear distances together. So this is called the Manhattan distance because if you go on Google Earth or on a map on, on the internet and you look at Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, you will see Manhattan is laid out as a grid. So there's a grid of streets. Not a very good grid there. Can do better than that. So there's a grid of streets. So to get from one place to another in Manhattan, you have to walk along that grid and around a corner. So Manhattan distances are always distances that go around these corners. And so that's what we're doing here. We're walking around a corner as if we were in downtown Manhattan to get to a distance and that's adding the distance A and B together. Okay, you might think this is a very elaborate way of explaining something that's really quite simple. And it is. The reason that we're doing it is so we can understand another way of measuring the distance between OTUA and OTUB and we will come to that in one minute. Before we do that, we want to go and we want to fill in our whole distance matrix based on our character matrix that we've been working with. So I'll do the first one of these again. So remember we're looking at the difference between our two, our, um, the difference between our two ATU, OTUs. Let me start that sentence again. We're looking at the difference between our two OTUs, A and B in this case, with respect to each character. With character 1, the difference is 2. With character 2, the distance is 1. With character 3, the difference is 1. With character 4, the difference is 2. We're going to add those up. 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 equals 6 and we are going to put that down here in our matrix. So what I want you to do right now is pause this video and fill in the rest of the matrix.
Have you paused the video? I can tell you haven't. Cut that out. Pause the video. Okay, I'm going to assume you paused the video, and if I ever find out you didn't, you're in big trouble. Here's the answers. We're going to use those numbers again, so keep them with us. Okay? So I'm not going to do those for you. You go and calculate those on your own. If you didn't pause the video, you can do it now and make sure you get those answers. Okay, I said there was another way to look at the difference or the distance between these two taxa. And this is called the Euclidean distance. Euclidean distance is the distance on the diagonal. And you can see it here represented by that solid black line. And if you remember the Pythagorean theorem, the distance, the measurement of that distance is the distance a squared plus the distance b squared and take the square root of that. And we see the calculation above. Now this is easy if we've got only two characters and I notice that my character names here are wrong. By the way, you might have caught that. That's character 2 and this is character 1 and we had our same character states which we can add in. And so we find that this is easy to think about how these calculations when we have only two characters. But if we had more characters, for instance the third dimension, we would have a third number, call it C, that we would have to add in here. And so we would just extend our distances here by adding etc. more terms to our calculation as we added more characters. Just the same as we would do it if we were <coughs> when we added the characters for the first distance matrix. So we can do this calculation and calculate this Euclidean distance, the distance on the diagonal. We'll do that on the next slide. Okay, now again we've got our character by OTU matrix at the top and a new distance matrix. But we're going to use the Euclidean distances to do the calculation again. I'll do the first one for you and then I'm going to ask you to do the rest. Okay, our first one. Remember, we're going to still start with our same distance calculations here, our same subtractions first. So the distance between A and B on character 1 is still 2. Between A and B on character 2 is 1. Here it's 1. And here again it's 2. And now we're going to take the square root of this was our a, our first distance here of 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared. And that's just the square root of 4 plus 1 plus 1 plus 4. And that's just the square root of 10. You can calculate that on your calculator to find out what that is num numerically, but for our purposes here, we can just put that in 
to our form. That's all we really need here. Into our OTU by OTU triangular matrix is where we're putting it. Okay, it is time to pause the video again. Pause the video. I'm not kidding. Pause the video. You're doing this calculation. I want your matrix filled in with square roots. Now. Okay, you better have done that. Here's the answers. So it looks a little different than last time. You can do those calculations out with your calculator, write this other, write this matrix out again to see numerical values there, because you might not intuitively know exactly which of these is bigger than the others. What we want to do right now is we want to take our two matrices. We have did these matrices in two different ways. We calculated them with the Euclidean distance, that's upper on the upper left, and with the Manhattan distance, that's the first one we did on the lower right. And let's look at the order we put our similarities in these two cases. That's easier to see a little bit on the lower matrix, so we'll start there. So the biggest one of those is AB, so we'll write AB, that's the biggest one. That number is greater than, oops, actually equal to, equal to BC. And those two numbers, sixes, both of them, are bigger than the next one, which is AD. And AD equals the distance between CD. And that one is bigger than BD. The interesting thing happens when we look now at the distance over here on the Euclidean distances. Now our biggest one is the square root of 12 BC. So here we find BC greater than AB greater than AD which is the same as CD which is greater than BD, which is greater than AC. And I see I forgot to put AC down here too. This is also greater than AC. So there's some similarities here between the two, but here's the big difference. There's a different order here at the very beginning. So we've used two different methods of calculating our distance mat matrix. And we've got different answers. Slightly different, but still different. So they're giving us different answers. Isn't that a little odd? Is that odd for a technique that is supposed to be uh, objective and repeatable? What's going on here? Well, what's going on is that this isn't classical taxonomy or evolutionary systematics. It's not that the phoneticists want a method that is perfect, that is the best method of doing math. They're not looking for that. They're looking for a method that is better than classical taxonomy or evolutionary systematics. Same, th same thing, two different names for the same thing. And what you get in this, with these methods, no matter which way you calculate your distance matrix, you know what you did. You know where your numbers came from, and somebody else who used the same method would be able to go back and 
get the same answer that you did. Whereas with evolutionary systematics, someone comes back and looks at the same data and, well, it's up to them. Are they getting the same answer or not? It Maybe not. And if you got, they didn't get the same answer, how would you know why they didn't get the same answer? You couldn't tell. So the big difference in phonetics and evolutionary systematics is that now you can tell. You know why you got the answer and someone could repeat it. It's not, the big difference is not that in evolutionary systematic, I'm sorry, the big difference is not that in phonetics we always get the same answer independent of what technique we use. No, our answer is dependent on the technique we use. But we can say precisely what the technique was and someone else can repeat our work. That was very important to the phoneticists and in fact has been very important ever since. So this is the legacy of phonetics, this emphasis on repeatability and objectivity. Well, we still haven't got a classification. What we've got is some kind of ordering of the taxa. We know which ones are the most similar. If we're looking at the Manhattan distance, A and B are the most similar to each other. A and C are the least similar to each other. But that's not good enough. We need some other way of summarizing this in a nice, clear way. And so what is next for us then, or for the phoneticists, are a dendrogram. Dendro means tree. Gram is a like a graph. Um, let's say writing. So a, a tree graph. These are not phylogenetic trees. This is really important to remember. They're going to look a little like phylogenetic trees, but they're not. So no matter how they look, they're not phylogenetic trees. What they are is they're summaries, and perhaps we should even say tree-like summaries of distance matrices. So tree-like summaries of distance matrices. So they're a way of making what we've uh, making the data we got in the distance matrix easily understandable, and we can calc we can turn these dendrograms into classifications relatively easily. So they want an easy to understand diagram. They're easy to understand and they are easy to translate into classifications. Let's look at one. So here's a dendrogram. We are not going to go into the mathematics of how these are created from the um, distance matrices. Okay, there's a number of ways to do that. It's really beyond the um, what we want to do in this course. It's really beyond what we want to do in this course to look at the mathematics of how this is done. But there are ways, a number of different ways, in fact, to translate our distance matrix into a graph like this. So what we see on a graph like this is a visual summary of the distance matrix. What we have on our axis, our really one axis, is our coefficient of similarity. So this is a measure of how similar our taxa are.
really we should still say OTUs, how similar two OTUs are. Two OTUs. So this is a level of similarity here. So this is a really simple dendrogram. It's only got three levels of similarity. The levels of similarity are hierarchical. They're like a phylogenetic tree. Not a phylogenetic tree, but they're like a phylogenetic tree in that they have hierarchical levels of similarity. So we can say that A and B are most similar We wanted to know how similar B and C are. We would have to look up here. So that's the level of similarity of B to C, etc. So we can determine from this diagram the level of similarity of any pair of taxa and of groups of taxa. We can look at the level of similarity of how similar are E and F to B and C. How similar are these groups? Well, we look up here, we follow this group all the way up to where it has the same level of branching as E and F and so the level of this is the level of similarity of well, I'm going to write CD together C comma D in parentheses to the group E comma F. So it's that upper level, lower similarity. All right, so that's a very simple kind of dendrogram to understand what they're going on, what's going on with them. Here is a what a more real dendrogram this looks like. This is a dendrogram that one of my students created for a project she was doing on the genus Quercus, the genus of oaks. And you see that there's lots of levels of the in the hierarchy. And so um, we could determine the level of similarity for any two taxa here. You can see some of them are very similar and some of them are quite different from each other. There's just really big, those two big clusters of groups of taxa. So we can summarize what we know about dendrograms by saying dendrograms are hierarchical summaries. of distance matrices. They are not phylogenetic trees. And they do not incorporate any information about evolution. Now that's a little odd because you start to wonder now about how evolution plays into this. Well, phoneticists were not anti-evolutionary. Phoneticists were evolutionary biologists. They just had uh, some really different opinions about how evolution should be used. So they wanted to have, they, they wanted to be able to say something about evolution based on their classifications. But they didn't see any direct way to incorporate evolutionary information in the classification or in the dendrogram 
they didn't see a way to incorporate evolutionary information into the dendrogram itself. Think back about the methods that we've used. We haven't said anything about evolution. We've only talked about similarities. So the phoneticists are concerned about similarities, repeatability, objectivity, and if they could think of a way to incorporate evolution while still maintaining the emphasis on those things I've just mentioned, repeatability, objectivity, etc., if they could think of a way to incorporate evolution, they'd do it. But they didn't. They couldn't think of it. So they couldn't think of a way to make evolution in their classifications or in their dendrograms. What's going to happen in phylogenetic systematics is that the founder of the school of phylogenetic systematics, Willie Hennig, is going to come along and he's going to say, oh, well, I know how to make objective, repeatable classifications that incorporate evolution. And then he lays out a method to do it. And pretty much after 10 years or so, everyone believed him, and everyone accepted his methods. So it was a failing on the phoneticist's part, is that they didn't figure out how to incorporate evolution. Now, when I say they couldn't think of a way to incorporate evolution, they still wanted to say something about evolution. So we'll come back to this in just a minute, and we'll look at how they incorporated evolution after they made their classification. But what's going to be really important to them is that they make sure that when they say something about evolution, their assumptions are really clear. Okay, so if they are going to make an assumption, they want you to know they made it, and they want it to be kind of out in front and in your face. This completes our work on number three, fundamental principle number three, all that time, and still fundamental number three. The next ones are going to be pretty quick. That one was really tough to get that far. We are now going to take our dendrogram, and we are going to make a classification out of it. So here's fundamental principle Number four, distinct taxa can be recognized because correlations of characters exist in the group under study. Distinct taxa can be recognized because correlations of characters exist in the group under study. I'll write it out and then we'll talk about it. Distinct taxa can be recognized. because correlations of characters exist in the group under study. So remember I said they kind of wrote these fundamental principles backwards. This is really an, we've really worked through this principle already. What this principle says is that we can create a dendrogram. We can create a dendrogram using the methods that they developed, the phonetic methods. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. And then we are going to get take our dendrogram and we are going to draw some circles on it, just like we would do with a phylogenetic tree, to make some taxa. The important word here is use or three words, use the dendrogram.
So if we want to circumscribe the taxa on here that agree with the dendrogram, we might say there is a good taxa. Here is a good taxon. If we were put together something like D and E, that would be a poor. That taxon is not supported by the similarity relationships shown in the dendrogram. Okay, so it's not supported by the sole similarity relationships. So in other words, our circumscription has to give us taxa that agree with the branching pattern in the dendrogram. Has to agree with the branching pattern in the dendrogram. This is exactly the same as we've been doing in class all semester with phylogenetic systematics. Now the phoneticists didn't, didn't stop here. They went on and they gave some rules or principles for circumscribing taxa. Besides saying that they had to agree with the branching pattern in the dendrogram, they wanted to give some guidelines for how you should do this. Because remember, they want to make repeatable objective classifications. So there should be some repeatable and objective ways in which you can circumscribe your taxa based on your dendrogram. So there's four of these. I'll write them out and you then tell me whether you think they are objective and repeatable. First principle, they want medium-sized taxa. Second principle, the circumscription should whoops, should agree with the aims of the classification. So an aim might be, are you making a key? Maybe that's one circumscription. Are you organizing a herbarium? Maybe that's a different circumscription, etc. So the phoneticists are thinking that there could be different reasons you want to make a classification. And maybe you're going to circumscribe your taxa differently depending on what you aim to do with the classification. So there could be, you know, different, really different classifications out there. You think it's confusing now. Suppose this really happened and that people made three or four different classifications of the plants and the families were differently circumscribed in those cases. Gosh, who could ever learn anything? Now, we're going to see when we get to phylogenetic systematics that the phylogenetic systematists are going to say there's only one reasonable, true, scientific reason for having a classification, and that's to represent evolutionary history. And so this whole idea that there might be alternate kinds of classifications, the phylogenetic systematists are going to say, oh, no, only evolution. That's the only important thing that we should be looking at, the only important biological principle that we should be putting in our classifications or using to make our classifications. What's number three? Principles already established in the group under study. So if you were to look at the sunflower family, and you saw out of those 4,000 genera or something in the family, um, you knew them well, you could see what principles did the systematists use when they established those. Maybe they wanted smaller size taxa, maybe they wanted you know 10 species in a taxa, whatever it is, you would follow those same kind of principles if you were working in 
that family. And the fourth, fourth one, this one kind of gives away the answer to my question at the beginning, whether these are objective or not. The fourth one is aesthetics. The phoneticists wanted aesthetically pleasing classifications, whatever that means. Now, to an evolutionary systematist, they would kind of know what that meant. They'd have an intuitive sense of that, and they would try to make their classifications pretty. But, you know, these guys are not evolutionary systematists. These guys are the objective, repeatable guys. And so it's kind of funny when they say medium-sized taxa, whatever that means, and aesthetics, that these are kind of, these are the principles for the circumscription of taxa. Well, we're going to go on now and finish up our seven principles. There's four of them left, and they are pretty easy. Here's number five. Phylogenetic inferences can be made on an a posteriori basis given certain assumptions about evolution. A posteriori means after the fact. So let's think about this for a minute and we'll look at the next slide. So here we have our dendrogram of Quercus again. And let's look at a possible grouping of species that is in accordance with the dendrogram. You can see that's group here. It's in this branch. If we know that those are similar, what would we expect about their evolution? Pause the video again and think about that for a minute. Okay, I hope you paused it. Well, I think that we would say that they have a common ancestor. So we would expect similar things to have common ancestors. That's an assumption. The assumption is that similar taxa have a common ancestor. Notice that we can make that assumption explicit. Someone can come along and disagree with it or agree with it, whatever they like. But they will know how we made our evolutionary interpretations. So that's what they mean by this fact that phylogenetic principles can be made on an a posteriori basis given certain assumptions about evolution. And this is not supposed to be the word principles. This is supposed to be the word inferences phylogenetic inferences can be made on an a posteriori basis given certain assumptions about evolution. Number six, taxonomy is viewed and practiced as an empirical science. You see, that should be number one. We've covered that already many times. That is the basic assumption of what of the phoneticists. Number seven, classifications are based on phonetic similarity. And that should be number two. Those two principles, six and seven, underlie everything that we have done so far. Well, we're almost done. We have only one more to deal with, and that is the treatment of fossils. So this is another one where I want you to pause the recording. So let's assume you're a phoneticist. You've understood every of the principles of phonetics, and you've just found this fossil leaf. You want to incorporate it in your classification. 
what do you do? What is the first thing that you do? And what is the second thing you do? How do you put this in your classification? Pause the video, write that down, pause it now, and come back then. Okay, we should be back. How are we going to place our fossil? We are going to treat that fossil exactly like we treated any data we would get from an existing organism. So we're going to measure its characters or measure or record. Place it in a data matrix and in a distance matrix. We're going to find its place in a distance matrix and we're going to place it on a dendrogram. So a fossil is treated like anything else. So let's just say we have a fossil and we're going to put it at some intermediate level of similarity, say that it's here. It comes down here off C and D. There it is. So if we had to create a group, so there's a taxon not supposed to contain E. There's the taxon containing the fossil. It's C, D, fossil together. It agrees with the dendrogram based on similarity relationships and the fossil is not placed in an ancestral descendant relationship with anything. So fossils are not placed in phylogenetic systematics into these ancestral descendant relationships. They are placed, like every other taxon, into phonetic groups. Why? Why are they placed, not placed in ancestral descendant relationships? Because we do not have a method to put them there. Our methods are based on similarity. Similarity creates groups. We got a fossil, we treat it like anything else. We put it in a group. We don't have a method. We don't know how to make a method to put them in ancestral descendant relationships. It was an assumption, a big assumption, the phoneticist will say, a big assumption that is really unacceptable when the evolutionary systematists place taxa into ancestor descendant relationships and they're not willing to do it. Now we know that the fossil goes in this group because we've placed it there by phonetic methods. We do get some really interesting information out of that. Let's say we know the fossil is a certain age. Three hundred million years old. So 300 million years ago this fossil was a living creature. What do we know about this group? Well we know that at least one member of this group existed 300 million years ago. So if we had to say when did this group originate, well we'd say it was at least 300 million years ago. That's a really different way of thinking about fossils than in evolutionary systematics. But that's the phoneticist for you. We're going to see something similar when we come to phylogenetic systematics. So let's kind of summarize what we know. Not in detail, but an overview. Phoneticists want a taxonomy that's objective.
That means that it is as little dependent on human judgment as possible. Another way of saying that is it demands the minimal number of assumptions. And they want a taxonomy that is empirical. That means it's based as much as possible on observations alone, on characters, characters and character states. They want to use as little theory as possible. That's kind of like saying as few assumptions as possible. And so you can see they've attempted to do this by emphasizing the characteristics that can be measured and then using numerical techniques that if they're not perfect, they at least are repeatable in the sense that you can tell someone exactly what you did and they can do it. And you just can't imagine the effect this had on systematics when people came out and said, you taxonomists, you need to be doing real science. You need to be able to tell people exactly why you're making this classification so that they can know if they agree with you or not, not based on their intuition, but on based on how you've used the data, based on how you've used the calculations. It was a tremendously important development in the development of modern systematics. And we'll continue with this when we look at the next school of systematics, phylogenetic systematics.